Vladimir Putin. Part 1. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. This is the analysis of the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Before I get into the analysis, it's important to ensure that you, the viewer, understand the basis on which this analysis has been undertaken. A huge amount of material has been reviewed with regard to the determinations and observations that I shall make. Not everything that has been reviewed and analysed will be referred to specifically and directly, but nevertheless it has had a cumulative effect upon the observations. In some instances the material repeats, coming from a variety of sources demonstrating similar points, and therefore those observations have been advanced as a point of singularity rather than the repeated references that have been made. Understand, this is a determination to, de to ascertain what Vladimir Putin is. It is not a pronouncement as to whether he is good or bad. Indeed, the concept of good or bad are entirely subjective. And there is no objective definition of what amounts to good or bad, right or wrong, good or evil. It is something that is ascertained by a subjective individual, by their own standards and their own perspective. Indeed, this very point is something that will be addressed by Vladimir Putin's outlook and perspective, something I will be touching on later. This is no hatchet job that's designed to paint him in a particular light. Instead, it's an analysis based upon a wide-ranging source of evidence, carefully reviewed, carefully analysed, and then explained. There is much that has been stated about Mr. Putin, and you can make your own determination as to whether you accept the veracity of that material. If you do not, that's a matter for you and you're perfectly entitled to do so. I have sought a wealth of different sources, not all based in the West, but from those that are based in Russia, other countries as well, from difficult, different organisations, many of which are not political in nature, to get as much as a rounded perception and picture of Vladimir Putin as one can obtain. Naturally, there will always be aspects of him that are shrouded in secrecy, and that factor of itself tells us much about his personality. There will be aspects which might not have been portrayed in, at all, certain aspects that have been portrayed in a particular light that suits the individual making the observation. And therefore, in order to try and accommodate potential bias, I have drawn the material from a wide range of sources. The more, the better to avoid such a reliance. The purpose of this is to assess what Vladimir Putin is. Is he a disordered individual or something else? I utilise the characterization, characterization that I have adopted in order to help you understand more about narcissism and psychopathy. I utilise my lexicon and nomenclature, as that is easier for you to understand. There will be others that will use different systems which mean similar things to what I am stating, but I am using my material based upon a wealth of evidence that I have examined. With all of that stated, you could now settle down and embrace a detailed explanation of what Vladimir Putin is. Russian leader Vladimir Putin was born in 1952 in St. Petersburg, then known as Leningrad. After graduating from Leningrad State University, Putin began his career in the KGB as an intelligence officer in 1975. Putin rose to the top ranks of the Russian government after joining President Boris Yeltsin's administration in 1998. 
becoming Prime Minister in 1999 before taking over as President. Pyotin was again appointed Russian Prime Minister in 2008 and retained his hold on power by earning re-election to the presidency in 2012. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, he retired from the KGB with the rank of Colonel and returned to Leningrad as a supporter of Anatoly Sobchak, a liberal politician. On the latter's election as mayor of Leningrad in 1991, Pyotin became head of external relations and the first deputy mayor in 1994. After Sobchak's defeat in 1996, Pyotin resigned his post and moved to Moscow. In 1998, he was appointed deputy head of management in Boris Yeltsin's presidential administration, in charge of the Kremlin's relations with the regional governments. Shortly afterwards, he was appointed head of the Federal Security, an arm of the former KGB, and head of Yeltsin Security Council. In August 1999, Yeltsin dismissed his Prime Minister, Sergei Stavarsin, together with his cabinet, and promoted Pyotin in his place. In December 1999, Yeltsin resigned as president appointing Pyotin acting president. <clears throat> Until official elections were held in early 2000. He was re-elected in 2004. In April 2005, he made an historic visit to Israel for talks with Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. The first visit there by any Kremlin leader. Owing to term limits, Putin was forced to leave the presidency in 2008, but not before securing the office for his protégé, Dmitry Medvedev. Putin served as Medvedev's prime minister until 2012, when he was re-elected as Russia's president. That is the short history of Vladimir Putin's rise to power. But let us go back to his developing years. He was born in 1952 in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, a city that lived under a long Nazi siege during World War II that killed most of the population. His father was badly wounded in the war. His mother nearly died of starvation. Before Pyotin was born, his parents had lost two children. They had a room in a ramshackle apartment with two families. His father worked in a factory. His mother did odd jobs much of the time. Pyotin was left to fend for himself against bullying in his neighbourhood, lack of control environment, of poverty, an absence of emotional support, victim of bullying. Both of Pyotin's parents had survived the war, but his father had been badly injured by shrapnel and his mother had nearly died of starvation. They were also emotionally traumatised. By the time he was born, they'd already lost two sons, the first dying from diphtheria in infancy during the war, the second passing away in an orphanage shortly after the war ended. Vladimir was born into an atmosphere of hunger, disability and profound grief. Psychotherapist and author Joseph Burgo wrote in The Atlantic in 2014. This, of course, is far from a healthy environment and one which supports and fosters a lack of control environment. In essence, Pyotin faced issues of food, shelter, attachment, bullying and inherited parental trauma, all factors which would point to a lack of control environment. Pyotin got mentors. He learnt judo. He excelled in high school. He got a law degree and joined the Soviet Union's main security agency, the KJB, before entering the Kremlin. He was a macho man who many also saw as distrustful and unforgiving. The presence of these mentors are intervening factors, which in some instances might ordinarily have shielded him from the creation of a disordered personality. But it would appear from the evidence that his personality had formed to such an extent that the inclusion of these mentors could not be that of interveners, and instead, his personality harnessed these mentors to weaponize him further. 
suggesting a more potentially advanced form of his disorder. Such was his ability to look upon other matters and essentially decide, that will work for me. This is something that can occur where the disorder has already become cemented. When you look at Putin's early years, the adverse child experiences are numerous. There's a lack of food, inadequate housing, bullying, neglect, parental, dis parental depression. All of this supports a complete lack of control environment, one in which a disordered individual is likely to be created. If you'd like to understand more about what creates, for instance, the narcissist, listen to my video, What Makes a Narcissist. He also inherited the issue of wartime trauma from his parents, personified by Nazi forces that threaten their existence and their homeland. It's also evident that he didn't get any appropriate attachment, the strong and requisite bond between a parent and child that invariably leads to a healthy life and without which children can become disordered. This attachment was absent because his parents had to work most of the time, or it might be that they even didn't know how, and it may well be that they were also too preoccupied with their own issues to be attached parents to him. Such preoccupation suggesting that at least one of his parents may well have been disordered themselves, creating the potential for genetic predisposition. There's also no mention of any other family members, no involvement from grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and therefore potential intervenors at the early ages, i.e. below 10, Mr. Putin appear to have been absent. Kindness, affection, warmth, emotional support were not part of his early world. Putin started out as a victim, Victim experience potentially forging victim mentality. Much of his history, of course, is closely guarded. But what we do know that his is a serious case of starting off in a very disadvantaged situation and becoming fabulously wealthy. It's very much a case of rags to riches. The Russian leader, who is rumoured to be worth as much as $200 billion dollars, was born into this poor working-class family in the rubble of post-war Lenin post Leningrad, the city that had been bombarded by the Nazis. It's been described that the family lived in a ramshackle Soviet apartment with two other families in a block of flats that was apparently infested with rats. There were hordes of rats in the front entryway. My friends and I used to chase them around with sticks, Putin wrote in his 2000 autobiography. Once, I spotted a huge rat and pursued it down the hall until I drove it into a corner. It had nowhere to run. Suddenly, it lashed around and threw itself at me. I was surprised and frightened. Now, the rat was chasing me. Luckily, I was a little faster and I managed to slam the door shut in its nose. There, on that stair landing, I got a quick and lasting lesson in the meaning of the word, cornered. This was a recollection from Purtin, one that has been repeatedly referred to. This evidence is a victim mentality, a learned response, and moreover, a recognised response to what was occurring, which suggests potential awareness. Purtin's former school teacher, Vera Dmitrovina Gurevich, called the family's living conditions cold and awful. There was no hot water, no bathtub, the toilet was horrendous, she once said. While his mother did a series of back-breaking jobs and his father worked in a factory, Pyotin was left to fend for himself. He spent an increasingly large part of his time in the communal courtyard below, a space dominated by drunken thugs, cursing and fistfights, biographer Masha Gessin explains. Again, lack of control environment, suitable adverse influences that would hone his development in a particular way. Gessin and other biographers describe Pyotin's Childhood as mean, hungry, and impoverished, and say he was bullied and humiliated as a child. He was small for his age, and learnt martial arts and then judo to defend himself, harnessing methods of defence. Later, he joined a street gang, 
and learnt what he described in 2015 as an important rule. If a fight is inevitable, you have to throw the first punch. Reliance on aggression to assert control as opposed to a conciliatory approach instead. He's always been a scrapper, explained British cartoonist Daryl Cunningham, author of Putin's Russia, The Rise of a Dictator. Cunningham interviewed a childhood friend of Putin's for the book, who described how a young Putin would use any dirty method to win. He would bite, he would scratch, he would beat the boys who were bigger than him, which says a lot about his character. He still very much ignores any rules other people play by. He's still that little kid who fights dirty. Lack of accountability for rules, absence of emotional empathy for others affected by his behaviour, use of physical violence to assert control, lack of boundary recognition, competitiveness. According to the Kremlin website, Pyotin wanted to work in intelligence even before he finished school. He later admitted this was based on romantic stories about spies and was struck by how one spy could decide the fate of thousands of people. Grandiosity, assertion of control, magical thinking. He applied to join the KGB while he was still at school and was reportedly told to train to be a lawyer and that eventually someone from the KGB would contact him. That did happen. Someone appeared and recruited him. In 1975, after gaining a law degree from Leningrad State University, Pyotin was picked from more than 100 students to join the KGB. College classmate and fellow KGB officer Pavel Kozhelev said Pyotin was made for the role. His most outstanding trait, I would say, was his fighting spirit and his strong will to achieve his goals, he once reflected. Competitiveness, need to assert control. Pyotin went on to so-called spy school, honing his German and earning a black belt in judo. He was praised for his work ethic, evidence of industriousness, and worked his way through the ranks over the next 16 years, rising to the position of KGB Lieutenant Colonel before the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Exhibits a desire for power and advancement, utilising men for the assertion of control. It's clear from these early recollections of the rise of Vladimir Putin and his environment in which he grew up that the seed had been sown and the environment supported the post or the potential rather for a disordered outcome. It's clear that rather than fall victim to the environment in which he was exposed, he instead developed to seek to shape his environment around him instead, developing a scrapping mentality that the world was against him, but he was not going to allow it to defeat him. He was born into a world of very limited opportunity, but managed to find a structure which harnessed his personality and allowed him to seek advancement at the same time, to attend to his sensitivity to threats to control and his increasing need to assert control, albeit it would appear in a rather crude and bludgeoning manner. We have seen how there was the suggestion of a genetic predisposition towards disorder and, moreover, a very clear lack of uncontrolled environment, which contained the absence of emotional support, hunger, humiliation, physical violence, bullying, and overall starting him off in life as very much a victim. But something meant that he did not drown in this environment of being a victim. He did not go under. Something forged and developed, which caused him to fight back, to cause him to develop in a particular way to defend himself. Part two will examine how this rough gem then became polished. However, it was not because he was influenced by others, but instead he harnessed the advantages that others could convey upon him, potential character trait acquisition. His personality had then formed, and had done so in a particular way, and was utilising what was available to improve its host's world. In essence, what was happening was akin to a black hole, dragging planets and stars towards it to consume them for its own purposes. Join me in part two as we continue to examine the life of Vladimir Pyotin and 
taking information from further sources to assess what was going on in his climb to power and what this tells us. Please ensure that you like this video, direct others to it, and I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening so far.